but I frankly don't think there's ever been a year as interesting or a point in time as interesting as this one. And as we think about M&A strategy and we think about the tactics and the timing of deals, I think it's so critical that we give full consideration, not just to the structure of the deals, but the timing of the deals, and to better understand and, and bring more precision and thought to where we are in the economic cycle, how the different influences across the economy may or, or may not influence deals, I think is a, a very prudent and appropriate part of the practice. Um, and it's certainly been an honor to have Bill Strauss with us um, in years past, and certainly honored to have him back uh, today. And so um, it's certainly an honor to have you here. Please uh, welcome Bill Strauss with a round of applause, if you would. And the stage is uh, yours. Here's your clicker. Okay. All set to go. And should be all set to go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, timing is great. I mean, we just uh, had our sixth uh, FOMC meeting yesterday. And so uh, we uh, came out with uh, an announcement that the Fed increased interest rates by 25 basis points, uh, bringing it up to just over 2%, between 2 and 2.25%. Two and uh, hopefully you could appreciate that historically that is still all in all a very low interest rate. We're still not quite to that level that's regarded as uh, neutral. Uh, but in addition to the uh, uh, announcement about that, uh, even though the Fed meets eight times a year, four times a year we put together what is known as a summary of economic projections, the SCP. And uh, that was one of those special meetings yesterday uh, where, we, we, where we had uh, uh, an update. In fact, I love the September SCP in particular because we also add an extra year to the outlook. So for the first time, the Fed is offering up what they view as the outlook for 2021. So we'll, we'll go through all of those uh, uh, projections. So how is the U.S. economy doing? Well, we're in the second longest expansion in U.S. history. Uh, the longest expansion is actually presented up in this uh, chart as well. It's that period during the 1990s when the economy grew consecutively for 120 months. Uh, if this economy that we have continues to grow through the middle of next year, so if it's still growing in July, this will become the longest expansion in U.S. history since we're in the 10th year currently. Um, and I think there is a fairly good chance of that, in part because uh, when you think about the, what causes an expansion to come to an end, it is certainly not that we die of old age or that we run out of steam. It is a, usually some kind of an event that causes, we call those negative economic shocks, that causes business activity and, and personal uh, consumption decisions to alter the way they would normally progress. Um, and in fact, the way we think about the economic growth for our economy is one where it grows at a roughly two percentage point uh, gain. Uh, two, one eight to two percent is what we think of as trend growth, driven by labor force growth of less than one percent and productivity growth of around one to one and a quarter percent. So you add those two together and you get this trend like performance of two percent, and that's what we should achieve year in and year out. In fact, over the course of this expansion now, uh, in, in its 10th year, economic growth has averaged 2.3%. Uh, so just slightly over that amount, which is kind of a tortoise-like performance. It's been moderate and steady. Uh, but one of the advantages of that is that, well, when you think about what can put your economy at risk, well, it could be that one particular industry kind of gets out of bounds, kind of goes a little bit crazy, like the housing market did during the last expansion. And when that corrected, of course, it took down uh, the financial sector with it, and we had a major recession. Um, so when you look around the real side of the economy, it's you don't see any particular sector that appears to be out of balance, or certainly one that's not too hot. Um, some are doing better than others. Manufacturing is doing well, but there's still slack there. Uh, the labor market as well looks to be, on, its, on some measurements, very tight with an unemployment rate that has been below 4% for now four months this year. Um, but still, we're adding a lot of workers. So to me, that is suggestive. And we're adding a lot more workers than underlying uh, contributions of new workers into the pool would suggest, suggesting to me that we still have some ability of growing that sector. 
Uh, the economy on a year-over-year -year basis, we don't have uh, third quarter yet, and we won't even have third quarter GDP until the end of October. That's one of the problems with GDP is there's quite a lag involved in it. So we only have data up through June, and that's the second quarter data that's presented up here. Will we? And in fact, we got an update on it this morning. That's that's uh, these these charts have not been updated with that, but it was unchanged. 4.2 percent. Uh, was the growth rate in the uh, second quarter, uh, which sounds really impressive, and you can see we've had numbers like that before. Uh, but keep in mind, it also came off of a very modest 2.2% growth in the first quarter. So averaging them out, the first half of the year has come in at 3.2%, not very different from the 2.9% that we have averaged over the past year. This is clearly uh, substantially better than that trend-like growth. So it, this is a strong economy that we are operating in at this point. So the president has talked about, you know, having a 3% economy, and is that possible? Absolutely. We've seen it before. Look at going back to the 90s or the early part of, of the noughts. Uh, we saw growth, the blue line there, that was up in the 3 4% range. The question of, is it sustainable? That's a whole other question. And there you have to think about, are you doing anything to change the underlying structure of trend growth? Are we having labor force that is going to be able to grow faster? Well, given the fact that labor force is driven by population growth, which takes a very long time to alter, because even if we encourage a lot of people to start having kids right now, it's still going to take you 16 months and, oh, sorry, 16 years and nine months to make that worker. So that wouldn't impact the economy until the 2030s. The other part of it is immigration. And we certainly have a lot of people who would love to come work here with the kind of skills we look for. I just think this administration is not going to be too favorable to increasing that allotment. Uh, so therefore, in order to get a 3% economy, you've got to practically double productivity growth. And who wouldn't want to do things more effectively, more efficiently than we're currently doing? It's just a very high hurdle to achieve. It would require a heck of a lot more capital investment. It would be, require a heck of a lot more training of your workforce for the kind of skills that are needed into the future, which, by the way, is probably my number one concern for our economy, is that we're not doing as good a job at that as I I think we would like to do. Um, so the point is, is that it's very hard to move the needle on that. And I think you're going to see that the FOMC kind of agrees with me uh, with regard to that. So um, while we don't have third quarter data yet, we do have a measurement, and I've shared this with you before, that talks about uh, how we're doing more recently. The National Activity Index the zero line there, that black line, is a line which suggests that the economy is growing near its trend rate of growth. This is higher frequency data, monthly data, and we have it up through August. So we have the two months out of the third quarter already reflected here. And as you can see, it has improved quite substantially. It has moved above zero. So if zero is trend, above zero is better than trend. So certainly picking up that surge of activity that we have seen most recently. But as you can see, it kind of has downshifted a bit as we have moved into the summer. Uh, and that would be, but still above zero, that would be suggestive of still a decent number but probably not replicating that kind of 4% number that we saw in the second quarter. But in terms of thinking about the business cycle, um, I, you know, I, the other advantage of this is it can give us kind of a sense of whether we're beginning to slip into a recession. Uh, and, and, and if we go below zero, it means the economy is underperforming what it's capable of doing. It doesn't mean a recession per se, but it means that maybe we're going at 1% compared to the 2% that we should achieve. But if it gets down too low, typically, if you look at about a minus 0.7 to a minus 1.3, you can see that when our index, in particular the three-month moving average, the blue line, has slipped into that range, it goes into that gray shaded area where activity now has gone negative and we see declines in economic activity, i.e. a recession. Uh, so the good news is we're not even close to that. We're still running well above that, and again, better than trend. So what other signs of optimism are there? Well, certainly the stock market. Stock market is supposed to be this all-knowing, right, the efficient market theory, or 
and University of Chicago afterwards, the efficient market theory that talks about the fact that what's incorporated into the prices here is everything that people know about the future. Because when you're buying, as you all know, when, you, when you're buying an asset today, a stock today, it, it's past, it, it's the past. It has nothing to do with what you're willing to pay for it today. It's all based upon what you think it will do for you in the future. So the very fact it's a very forward-looking indicator and it moving higher as it has continued to do is suggestive of an economy that continue to, will continue to do quite well. As an economist, the other aspect is the wealth effect. Uh, those of you who have equity investments, 401ks and elsewhere, eh, when you compare the amount you have in those accounts today versus what they looked like a year ago, you got to be feeling pretty good, right? More than double-digit gains. Um, my, my boating friends out there. Uh, more than double-digit gains uh, occur. And, and the way we think about that is it generally means that people will spend a small portion of that, 2 3% of what we call the wealth effect. So people feeling wealthier, they'll spend. So if your account went up by $10,000, you might take two dollars $300 and take the spouse out uh, for a nice dinner, nice steak dinner at one of the steakhouses here to celebrate. Uh, you're not going to be do like what the housing market happened, where uh, it went up by fifty thousand, and people thought, "Well, those are permanent gains. I'll take forty-five thousand out of it." Um, and, and of course, when it corrected itself, uh, it was a ma ma massive problem. People appreciate the fact that as fast as this went up, it could also quickly go down. Anybody here uh, would be surprised by a twenty percent correction in the stock market in the, over the next year. Yeah, not a single hand in the room is up, uh, which, again, is, is, if you had your hand up, I would tell you you probably shouldn't be in the market because that's just a risk that you take with uh, investments. So let's get to the forecasts. So the Fed will provide a forecast for key economic data, GDP, unemployment rates, two measurements of inflation, and what they see as their policy tool, the federal funds rate. And I will cover all five of those. The red diamonds up here are the median forecasts of the 16 members of the FOMC, the 12 presidents and now the four governors that we have with the fact that we now have uh, the new vice chair as part of the Fed having just been confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Um, so um, uh, what you can see is that blue shaded area, that's the trend of uh, what the Fed regards as 1.8 to 2 percent, unchanged from their view of June. How has this forecast changed, in fact? Well, the GDP outlook for this year was, t was edged up a bit. In June, the view was that it would be just under 3 percent. Now it's just over 3 percent. Um, substantially different? Maybe a little bit, but not much. I mean, just uh, a tinge higher. Um, for next year, it moved up by a tenth of a percent to two and a half percent. So we're still looking at growth that is above trend by about half a percentage point. Uh, but you can see that it's slowing, you know. And so what can you ask, what, what kind of goose the economy to grow faster this year? I think you can't deny that the tax reform that we, that went, we went with at the end of December uh, definitely has played a role to kind of spur things on, um, certainly a major role. In addition, the regulatory environment has altered uh, business confidence and so forth. So we, we got this faster growth. But um, it's a sugar high, especially with the tax reform aspect. And once that begins to wane, it's drive on the economy begins to settle down. I think that's what we're witnessing here. Uh, for 2020, you can see the Fed has growth coming in right around trend growth of around 2%. Uh, that's unchanged from their view that they had in June. And for the first time, they're offering uh, what, you, what they think about 2021. And it's a very similar trend-like growth, but towards the bottom end of trend. So. That's kind of the view of the economy continuing to expand, although those growth rates moderating a bit. So risk of recession. You could ask some smart people, what do you think the risk of a recession is? Uh, so here is a survey of professional forecasters, and they are asked the question, what is the probability of having a recession over the coming quarter? What you can take note of, number one, is that the current measurement is low, but also importantly, it has moved lower. It's been moving lower, in fact, even before the election of 2016. It was already starting to move lower. And it has continued to move lower. And certainly having the economy growing faster 
has given people greater confidence that a recession is less likely. Why is that? Well, even if you had a negative economic shock that was a magnitude of, say, two percentage points of growth, if your economy is growing at 3 percent, all right, so it slows to 1 percent, not a recession. If your economy, though, is only growing at 1 percent and you get a 2 percent shock, now you've got a minus 1 percent economy and you're in a recession. So the faster the economy is growing, the more resilient it is to any given level of shock. Uh, if you ask them, how about going out two quarters? The probability is a bit more elevated. That's to be expected. More time, more bad things can happen. In fact, if you ask me what the probability of a recession over the next 10 years, I would say probably 98 percent, given the fact that the longest expansion has been 10 years, and we would be talking about almost a 20-year expansion. Highly unlikely, in my view, that something that something uh, that Something bad would not occur over that period that could cause us to go into a recession. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned some of the other factors. Of uh, Clearly, a, a sector getting out of balance could lead to a recession. Uh, you could have uh, you know, an incident like the terrorist attack that we had, a war like we had in 91, bad monetary policy that certainly the Fed tries to avoid, but not necessarily successfully all the time, bad fiscal policy. Uh, some people, you know, would say maybe the tariff thing that's going on right now is not helpful to the economy's growth. Uh, I think it's more of a nuisance at this point level, and I'll show some charts that would suggest uh, that we don't, it has not risen anywhere close to worrying about a recession. But nonetheless, you can see that a similar pattern, getting lower probability of, of recession. So the uh, Comp, uh, composite index of economic, leading economic indicators put out by the conference board, uh, you can see how, what, a, what a good indicator this has been in terms of thinking about when to start getting nervous about the expansion coming to an end. Because they look at a whole bunch of series that tend to move ahead of the overall business cycle. So in other words, they tend to start to fall before the business cycle actually starts to decline, before the economy's growth tends to decline. What's in there? Well, actually, the stock market is one of those components, as I said, has leading properties. Orders for durable goods is in there, out, manufacturing hours worked, things like that. So stuff that tends to move ahead of the overall economy. The most recent reading we have is August. It has continued to move higher. So, uh, and I was just at the conference board in May and had some nice discussions over there. They like to think that they can go out about a year in terms of predicting the downturn. Um, I think it's closer to nine months, but hell, I'll take nine months any day of the week if it uh, can give us a heads up to start looking. Just because it starts to go down doesn't mean it's going to happen. But I think it certainly causes you to take pause and to think deeper and, and, and harder about the factors that could be driving it uh, and, and, and issues that could be uh, on, within the economy. As mentioned, the labor market do incredibly well. 2.3 million jobs added. This is more than double what is the underlying trend of workers that we continue to add. In other words, the people turning from 15 to six, 16 years old. It's about a million kids a year. Uh, a net effect when you, when you factor out who should be retiring and so forth. So you can't keep adding over two million jobs. Eventually you're going to run out of workers. Um, and that's certainly something to, to, to think about. But and that, again, this level here tells me we're not there yet. We're still, all in all, uh, not completely removing the slack out of the labor market. The unemployment rate has fallen to really low levels. 3.9% uh, with the most recent reading. Uh, this is now four months below 4%. Uh, Going back to 1970, there was only one other time, and it's up here on the chart, uh, back here in the 99-2000 period, when we had it below 4% for only four months. We've already had four months this year. Uh, below 4%. So this is really impressive uh, for the labor market. In addition, there's some real benefits happening here. Uh, the rising tide of the overall economy's performance is beginning to lift all boats. For example, uh, we have data in the labor market that is uh, put out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that goes back to the 1970s on unemployment rate by uh, uh, race. And, and, when you, and when you look at African American, Hispanic, the lowest that we've seen over this period of time. 
So the longer I think, and this is one of the benefits of the sustained recovery and expansion, the longer we can have this go, the more we're going to be able to bring into the workforce for a longer period of time so they can acquire the skills, get, it, get, 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 get used to uh, being in, engaged in the labor market, the better off it's going to be for them as well as for the U.S. economy. What is expected? The Fed is saying it's looking pretty good. So with uh, a superior performance this year uh, of, of nearly a percentage point, over a percentage point over trend, it's going to drive the unemployment rate lower. Next year, the growth rate is still above trend, but only by half a percentage point. That still drives the unemployment rate lower. That's Oaken's law. Uh, and then we get into trend-like growth in 2020. That should leave the unemployment rate unchanged, so at least my policymaking friends are consistent. And then we get to the bottom edge of that, and they're suggesting that that's actually a little weaker than, than trend, so it's, it's going to begin to move the unemployment rate just up a little bit. So for over the next four years, three or, or three and a half years, the labor market is looking very, very solid and at levels that we haven't seen ever. So this is pretty impressive. Pretty impressive, yet where's the wage growth, right? If we're really at tight labor markets, one would think we would be seeing greater wage action. And, and wages are rising. The green line there, wages and salaries, the red line is benefits. They're moving higher, but not very aggressively, certainly when you compare to what we've seen in the past. And so you look at that and you go, well, that's about 2.8, 2.9% year over year. That's not bad. Except this is a nominal measured change. So inflation's running just over 2%, knock out that just over 2%, and you've got real wage gains that are still less than 1%. Not very impressive, as it has been over the past 10 years. As everybody is aware, it was one of the big issues about why the American workers feel like they're being left behind, that the economy is doing well, stock market is up tremendously, uh, but their sh participation, the, the income share for working, uh, has not uh, kept up. But I do believe that uh, uh, some indicators suggest that it's going to move higher. So here I'm taking a survey that is done by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Uh, their chief economist, good friend of mine, Bill Dunkelberg, uh, asked his, his, uh, his members uh, each month to answer a series of questions. Um, one of the questions on there is, do you plan to increase compensation? And if you, would, if you kind of move this by nine months, what you can see is that it lines up with what the employment cost index, that same green line here, presented with a very nice lineup, 84% correlation between the two. There's a couple of times that it seems to break apart. One of them was back here in the, in the noughts, uh, when they kept saying they're going to increase compensation, say they're going to increase compensation, but it didn't happen. And then when it corrected itself, it wasn't corrected by them saying, all right, I was just bluffing. I'm really not increasing compensation. Compensation did, in fact, finally move higher. So we got a very similar situation currently where they're saying compensation is going higher much more than what has actually transpired here. And I suspect when it corrects, it's going to correct in a very similar way as we've seen in the past. So uh, I think there's a good chance that we're going to see uh, wages and salaries continue to move higher and perhaps get up to that 4% range uh, sooner rather than later. So the question comes in, why hasn't wages done better? Well, I think you've got to kind of think about what we have come out of following the Great Recession. During the Great Recession, unemployment rates uh, skyrocketed up to 10 percent. Nearly 9 million workers, 8.7 million workers lost their jobs. So I just talked about the fact that we add about a million, a little over a million jobs or workers a year. So we all of a sudden released into the pool of available workers eight years or so worth of workers. So businesses, when they were just trying to decide, well, do I hire workers to meet growing, growing demand or do I buy a piece of machinery? Well, workers were plentiful and they were, as we saw, really inexpensive and much safer for expanding your production. Because if we happened to go into a recession and there was all this talk 
following the financial crisis, are we going to double dip? All these other issues about you know concerns around the world, uh, businesses would say. I'm much safer hiring workers rather than buying a piece of equipment because if we go into a recession, our labor laws are not like Europe. You can get rid of those workers and you're done with the cost. Whereas if you bought a piece of machinery and ever increasingly that machinery is uh, like a computer, has to be paid back more quickly even in the industrial sector, uh, it's a big mistake. The timing matters much more. So. That was, and, and the other aspect is the economy was only growing barely over trend, barely over 2%. And so you just hire a lot of workers, and that's what really took place. So um, productivity suffered over this period of time. Uh, so here's productivity growth, and it's like it's been below 1% for it looks like there, you know, last four, four years or so, but not really because this is a five year moving average. So it's really been below 1% for most of this expansion, the past nine years. Uh, and, and, and this is, as we all understand, workers ultimately get paid what they contribute in terms of the bottom line, i.e. productivity. So if productivity has suffered, they're not gonna be able to get those kind of wage gains. So why has productivity suffered? Um, well, I think in part, it was this dearth of investment. You can see that over the course of the expansion, the rate of capital investment just plunged to the point that in 2016, it actually went negative. We actually saw a reduction in our capital stock during an expansion. Now, we know capital stock falls during a downturn. Why buy a piece of new machinery when you got plenty of it sitting idle? But during an expansion, when you're producing more and the economy is growing, we actually had a reduction. It got to that point where, you know, unemployment rates had fallen below 5%. Wages were beginning to move higher. Over the last several years, the biggest factor has been can't find qualified workers, can't find qualified workers. That firms are finally running into a bit of a wall. And that kind of was suggestive that, you know, maybe they have to bite the bullet and actually make some investment. So I was actually already optimistic for an investment cycle even before the current administration came in. Uh, but certainly the tax reform, uh, as well as this more positive view by the business community, uh, has definitely spurred on probably some additional activity uh, over the uh, over the past couple of years. So we are adding capital. And I think that will help our, our bottom line, certainly with regard to uh, productivity. You can see the fact that productivity growth, uh, they have, now we're looking at it on a year-over-year -year basis, not a five-year moving average, uh, has come back. And it's back up to levels that we think of as more normal. In fact, the second quarter, if you looked at it just quarter two versus quarter one, expanded by nearly 3%. Uh, that's a really healthy gain for productivity. In fact, the gain was so healthy that when you looked at unit labor costs, in other words, how much did it cost to have labor? Because of that productivity, it actually cost businesses less. So I think that is kind of the important aspect to think about is, is capital spending and is productivity going to be able to perform well? Because if wages are rising, it doesn't necessarily mean that inflation is just around the corner. Because if workers are, say, contributing 3%, 4% more in terms of productivity, you could afford to give them, you know, not just a 2% inflation index, but something on top of that, maybe a 2 or 3% productivity bump. So you can give them a 4 or 5% increase in wages and not impact your bottom line because uh, they're delivering it in terms of that. So uh, this, as this would be just one example of that one quarter. Uh, you can look at profits as well. Profits continue to perform well, certainly suggesting that the increasing wages that are that have started to occur does not appear to be impacting the bottom line for profitability. Um, we have seen the inflation rates move higher. This is probably going to be uh, a little bit above 2%, probably a bit short-lived in part because we're still doing some relative comparisons to a year ago. A year ago, uh, 
those of you who can recall, we had this big thing where uh, AT&T and Verizon gave you free cellular data. Um, so that was a material enough to actually lower the inflation rate last year from over 2% to around 1.5%. So now when you're doing those comparisons against that ultra low level from a year ago, it makes things look higher today. We're about to exit that area of that comparison. So once we start comparing against the fall data, uh, it's going to look a little bit uh, different. In fact, we'll get an update for August uh, tomorrow. So I would suspect when that is done, we'll start to see it beginning to uh, edge its way down. But also, uh, it has moved higher because of energy prices. Energy prices have moved higher. That's something to you know kind of accept. Why is that happening? We're doing a lot better. Our, our economic growth is, uh, again, a full percentage point above trend. That means we're moving a lot more goods, a lot more people being hired. Uh, there's going to be need for a lot more energy usage. So prices have moved up accordingly. But it's still a bargain. Uh, here is the energy uh, consumption by consumers. This is for you know not just filling up their vehicles, but paying their electric bill, their heating bill little over four cents out of every dollar spent. But it's important to keep in mind, relative to its historical average, it has averaged over the past 57 years something closer to a little over six cents out of every dollar spent. The red bars are the decade averages. The current decade we are in is the lowest decade over the last uh, 60 years, basically. Um, and where we are currently is even substantially below that decade average that we're in. Quite the bargain. I've got some charts to really illustrate that, um, how, how inexpensive fuel, fuel is. Um, removing food and energy prices, the core rate of inflation, right at 2%. Um, what is the Fed thinking? Well, the Fed is basically saying with the uh, little sugar high economy growth that we have currently that is only temporary, it kind of adjusts back lower. We're gonna, we, we are not going to see inflationary pressures really build up. So I think, again, that story of the wage pressure and the wage story is probably going to be kept in check, I think, in part by productivity. So they see, as far as going all the way out of 2021, a pretty flat inflation story. And by the way, uh, Blue Chip has a very similar story. They don't go out as far. They're only out to next year. But they have basically unchanged inflation pace from this year and to next year. Um, removing food and energy prices, the Fed is, is also seeing basically flat inflation. So uh, nothing to, to worry about there. So I hate to put up a chart like this. You'll get copies of these slides. Um, but uh, uh, it brings up the issue. All right, so you're telling me that, uh, you know, the economy is, seems to be well balanced. Most sectors are not out of line. Uh, and, in, and inflation, therefore, shouldn't be much of an issue. But what about the rest of the world? Is there some other aspect of the world, some of the part of the world, which is going too hot? Is China driving their economy very strong, bidding up commodity prices, and that all of a sudden we're going to have to be uh, paying a lot more for the goods that we import or for the goods that we need as a raw material? So the Blue Chip Forecast Group looks around the world and makes forecasts. And what you can tell from looking at that is basically the U.S. economy is the strongest economy in the world right now. And the outlook for most economies around the world, those first three sets of columns there, when you go through the detail, is that their economies are growing, and in fact, many of them are slowing growth next year, much like the U.S., but uh, nobody is showing any sign of, of impressive growth around the world. And you can see that by looking at this next set of columns, which is the inflation measurements, which are all in all being kept in check. So there appears to be little concern about importing inflation from outside of the United States. And, and I think, you know, when you, when you talk about the tariff story that's going on, number one, I don't believe that uh, you can win a trade war. Uh, I think uh, tr uh, tariffs, and, and, you know, hurt your economy. And what you're basically saying with the tariff is I can hurt my economy more than you can hurt yours. Um, and so when they retaliate, they're actually hurting their economy. Um, and so uh, I think that what Part of what's going on here is when you do have the strongest economy, uh, I think you can weather the pain perhaps a bit better than an economy that might be trying to get business, economy that might be 
struggling. So we'll just have to watch. It's one of the more fluid aspects of thinking about uh, the outlook, uh, but uh, and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the manufacturing sector is doing very well. It's that industrial capital spend that I was just alluding to that's helping drive this along. Capacity utilization is moving higher, still not up to the level of roughly 79 to 80 percent that we would think of as more fully utilizing our, our, our uh, manufacturing side. Uh, to give you an example of how it's uh, driving uh, um, uh, employment, so manufacturing represents uh, about 9 percent of U.S. employment. We've had 2.3 million workers added over the past year. So its share should be, if it keeps its relative share, it should be about 200,000 jobs for manufacturing. Well, they've added uh, 254,000 jobs over the past year. So more than 10% gain of, uh, more than 10% of the gain has been manufacturing. So clearly punching above its weight in terms of uh, adding workers. So that is uh, a benefit for that capital investment cycle. Another way of illustrating how strong the manufacturing sector has been is to look at the purchasing managers' uh, results from around the world. So this is something that IHS Market Group puts together. Uh, I was in Frankfurt and uh, Zurich in February. Big discussion at the meetings that we held over there was all about the uh, synchronicity that we saw of growth around the world. And you can see that between November and February, that top line was green, above trend performance for the globe manufacturing. So things were going well all around the world. But as we moved into 2018, you can see that that has shifted and the numbers have fallen for the globe. The U.S. and Canada, the, tap, the next two lines there, remain solidly, solidly green all year long. Um, the uh, Europe is kind of in the middle, and what had been very solidly green throughout Europe has become more trend performance, and in fact, uh, for Italy, which is that one yellow number uh, most recently, uh, is flat. So there has been definitely some weakening in the European economy. The next set of grouping here is, Indi is, is Asia, and that had been doing okay, not as strong, but definitely all the green has disappeared and some yellow have appeared. So things have definitely kind of uh, softened a bit. The yellow is actually China. Um, and uh, so again, the point is, is that the U.S. and Canada, I'll throw that in there, appear to have the strongest economies in the world. The vehicle sector is doing well, doing well just under 1% gain. That's not going to last. Um, in part, uh, it was the fact that sales were really weak last year. Uh, and then I think we talked about it last year, how Hurricane Harvey and Irma uh, came in and wiped out about half a million to a million vehicles. And I talked about that we're going to see a replacement cycle. Well, it happened and then some. Uh, vehicle sales surged in the end of the year and remained strong for several months. but. Temporarily, it came back down. So we're about to start doing some comparisons in the fall against some really high elevated post-hurricane replacement demand. Uh, and Fl uh, Florence is not going to offset some of this. And there'll probably be some replacement from Hurricane Florence, but it wasn't anywhere as severe as what we saw for uh, Hurricane Harvey and Irma. But, you know, one way of illustrating how low energy prices has altered the mix of this industry, you know, here we have passenger cars and light trucks, and light trucks are pickups, sport utility vehicles, and crossover vehicles, which one could possibly argue is more car-like, but nonetheless, it's categorized in light truck market because of the capacity. Um, but what you can see is a clear preference for uh, more truck-like products, where passenger car sales this year are down over 13% for the first eight months of the year, uh, and light truck sales are up nearly 9% for the first uh, eight months of the year. Um, so we have seen this, this very significant shift, uh, and of course, this has led companies like Ford Motor Company to pronounce the fact that, uh, you know, they're not going to make cars anymore. They're getting rid of all of their cars with the exception of the Mustang and one other vehicle, off of a line that had probably about, a, about 10 different products. So this is a major pullback by a company, which is basically saying this is not a temporary issue. 
this is probably going to be with us for quite a while. Uh, and why? And why are they choosing this, by the way? Why? Why? Why are we seeing this? Uh, this shift, where in August we saw the market share for light trucks set a record, over 70 percent. Seven out of ten vehicles sold were trucks. Why is this happening? I heard it. Low gas prices. Just like I showed you on the chart before. Lowest that, we, that we've seen. And people want the room. When you ask people how important different factors are in their choice of a product, the fact of, of gasoline and miles per gallon is not even in the top ten issues that they, that they are concerned about. It's ride, it's comfort, it's the technology. Not even in the top ten of what people are focused on. Um, and so uh, what Ford is basically saying is that they think that this is going to continue, that the MPG issue is not going to be around. Um, and you look at the forecast by EIA, the Energy Information Administration, they are forecasting that energy prices remain pretty contained all in all. Oh, I, love, I should have done this little, little thing. Uh, so how many of you are people who care about the environment? Wow. Nice. How many of you are driving an all-electric vehicle? What? Oh, I, I expected to find at least a couple of Tesla people in this audience. Nobody? How about a hybrid? Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> One? One individual with a hybrid? Oh, you guys are you guys are you guys are not telling me the truth here. Uh, you said you care. But the reality is is that all of you are the blue line. Uh, traditional internal combustion engine, gasoline, and diesel powered. Um, the green line, the bottom, is everything else. Uh, and by the top line, there was 100%. So, you know, that includes, the green line includes the electric, the hybrids, the plug-in hybrids, the uh, uh, fuel cell, the natural gas power, the, you know, uh, solar, wind, <laughs> gravity, if you put it on a hill. Um, <laughs> Now, maybe I'm kind of misleading you with the old scale issue, lying with statistics. So let me put the alternative vehicles on their own scale. And you can see that with the introduction of the Prius, we saw some gains that occurred in the 15, uh, 18 years ago. Uh, and they can and it kind of, you know, suffer during the, during the downturn when, when fuel prices were bouncing all over the place. But then, you know, 2014, fuel prices went, or uh, petroleum prices went up to $107 a gallon. Um, we saw uh, gasoline prices up in the four to five dollar range, uh, and you know people were buying these. Then all of a sudden, gasoline prices collapsed in 2014, uh, and you can see what happened to the demand for these products. It too fell precipitously, um, and and it's it's moved its way back up. But still, 96 plus percent of the vehicles sold in August were the traditional vehicles. Uh, when you think about the quarter of a billion vehicles as the park, you know, and you're only adding here, you know, a couple hundred thousand vehicles, it's going to take a long time before some of this stuff comes to weigh in the economy. So blue chip is expecting, in part because of that comparison that's going to start, we're going to be looking at a, just a slight downtick in the auto sector this year and a little bit more next year although I would still say profitable for the auto industry. But this is fascinating. In an economy which is growing 50% faster than trend this year and growing non-trivially better than trend next year, vehicle sales actually are moving lower. Very suggestive of an industry that is not you know, basically beating themselves up to try to sell and grab market share, but they're actually enjoying making a profit and they're keeping themselves well behaved. Uh, I never thought in my career after seeing what went through in the 80s, 90s, and up until 2007 and all the way through 2009 with the bankruptcy of General Motors and Chrysler, I never thought that I would see a market so well uh, behaved. Uh, some other things, the Purchasing Managers Index is, is well above uh, 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 high levels, so certainly suggestive that, in fact, you'd have to go back to 2004 uh, to see levels of this magnitude. So again, the industrial sector doing well. Uh, blue chip is expecting above trend performance this year, a little bit softer next year as the economy's growth softens, but still 
all in all quite decent. The housing industry continues to pay the penalty for uh, the last, uh, the last uh, Great Recession, and that their blue chip is expecting uh, less than 1.3 million housing starts this year, a little over 1.3 million housing starts next year, still below the 1.4 to 1.5 million that is often thought of as more of a normal year. So let me close off on the financial side. Um, and one of the factors is um, that I, ha I love this indicator. So this is the credit spread, difference between two corporate I issuers of bonds, uh, AAA rated companies, junk bonds, high yield. Um, and, and the reason I like this is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the economy that it's hard to put your you know, head around, you know, whether it's the issues surrounding market volatility that came back into the market in February, whether it's the impeachment or the, the Russian collusion, uh, whether it's the tariffs, uh, whether it's, you know, whatever you could uh, imagine. Um, does that put the economy at risk for a recession? So this is kind of a big picture, recession or not. So risk on, risk off for recession. You can see that, uh, leading up to the financial crisis, this was already moving higher. Why? Because if you think you're going to go into recession, you're more worried about the junk bond company going out of business and not paying it back. So you start to raise the, the, the cost of them borrowing from you. You're asking for more interest rate, um, certainly more than what the AAA rated company would, 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 uh, would you expect from them. So, and then you can see what happened during the financial crisis, it came down. Here was the downgrade of U.S. government securities uh, back in 2011 when we went from AAA to AA+. Plus. And then here was all the beheadings and everything. Are we about to have a massive invasion, uh, you know, another big war? Uh, then things started to work its way down in the early part of 2016 uh, and came down even, so it was already moving down before the election. It continued to move lower. And basically since the election, it's like a, the patient's dead. I mean, there's absolutely no movement. Um, so I'm watching with all the stuff going on, is this market getting nervous? And the answer is no. And, and I like this as an indicator, because you know we had the survey of professional forecasters, but I kind of view them as, you know, we're at Vegas, uh, we're sitting on the outside of the craps table, the shooter's about to shoot the dice, and you and I are just out there kibitzing and saying, yeah, I think it's going to be a seven. Yeah, no, 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 I think it's going to be a five, you respond. Yeah, we're just talking, and that's kind of what the forecasters do, right? But these are the people who are at the table, putting their chips on the table, betting on what's going to happen, and I think that's a powerful uh, incentive to really express what your real feelings are. We could have just been not giving it much thought. Here, these are really, so they're not worried. The inversion of the yield curve, you probably already talked about this quite a bit. Uh, some people like the two year versus 10 year. I'm giving you the three month, why? Because the Fed does not make forecasts uh, of anything outside of the Fed funds rate. Um, tell a similar kind of story here where when it inverts, you wind up with a recession that shortly follows it. And certainly we're below 1% currently. What I'm giving you the three month is that blue chip, in fact, forecasts out uh, a three month, not a two year. So when you take the difference between that, what blue chip is basically saying is that uh, out through the end of next year, it's gonna continue to flatten, but still all in all remain positive and quite, I would say, fairly positive. Still about half a percentage point away from inversion. Does this make me a little nervous? Maybe a yellow flag as an indicator, something to pay attention to, but definitely it's not elevating to a, a red flag. Um, so finally, with regard to Fed policy, you know, uh, I should have changed that. I apologize. Uh, it uh, went up by 2% since uh, we increased yesterday. I knew I forgot something. So we're now between two and two and a quarter percent. Uh, and what is expected? The Fed is basically suggesting that we'll see one more rate increase. We've got two more meetings this year. Um, and that will still keep us below the neutral rate, which is regarded as between 2.8 and 3% nominal Fed funds rate. Uh, by the end of next year, we're kind of just topping a little bit over that. So sometime during 2019, we will move into that neutral stance for monetary policy. And then we kind of just barely tap the brakes towards the end. 
and then we kind of tap them a little bit harder, but not very hard, both in 2020 and 2021. And I think it's responding to that very low unemployment rate that the, that the policymakers see as remaining well below the natural rate. Finally, uh, with regard to our balance sheet, as I talked about last year, uh, that the Fed was just on the cusp of starting a balance sheet reduction program in October of last year, and we would begin doing it slowly, 10 billion roll off off of what it would normally be a 50 billion roll off that would naturally occur given the aging of securities. We would increase it to 20 billion a month roll off uh, in the first quarter, 20, uh, 30 billion in the second. We're currently at 40 billion. Starting next month, we will move that up to 50 billion, basically matching the normal roll off, and we will keep it at that level at this point. We haven't announced any difference. So we'll see this start to more materially fall off at the tune of around 600 billion a year. Um, we're just barely over uh, the 4 trillion, or right around the 4 trillion mark. So again, we should see that getting you know, below the 3.5 trillion mark uh, by, the, by a year from now. So in short, we're looking at an economy which is uh, likely to continue to expand. I think what I call the tortoise economy, the moderate and steady economy's growth, is going to give us the legs to uh, have a greater a chance of achieving this record expansion uh, as we move out into the uh, early uh, 2020s. Uh, with that, if we have time for a question or two, um, I'll take or, some questions or not. If you could advise the White House, presumably you'd have to go on Fox News, but uh, advise them on economic policy, what they should be really thinking about doing over the next couple of years. So the beautiful thing about working Tariff. at the Fed is that we do not advise the fiscal side on what they should do policy-wise. We are a user. We will we take, except for the fact that we'll say things like there are no winners with, with trade wars, things like that, but they know that. Uh, as much as uh, as they talk about these things. And to be fair, um, when I talk to my contacts, especially those in manufacturing, uh, they accept the fact that they're paying more for steel and they're suffering. You know, I was just out in Iowa, Davenport. Farmers are being uh, challenged. Uh, it was interesting to me, you know, because you hear the surveys that, uh, that the farm community who's paying a heavy price right now uh, is still very much supporting the president. That was certainly my sense from talking to farmers uh, out in Iowa, where they are, there's this belief that the short run pain is in part representing a long run gain. That if in fact somebody is not behaving properly in a trade, uh, in trading, putting pressure on them to alter and open up markets for us might be you know, a necessary evil of doing this pain in the near term. But unfortunately, I can't really suggest anything fiscal side. It's just we don't do that. The same way as we don't like to have the president uh, or anybody from Congress tell the monetary side what we should be doing. As you look at the, the long term, as you studied it, you know, the millennial, this big, huge demographic. Yeah. Let's say we did the easy math. They were born and I started in 1980. So they are now going to start going into their family formation years. Right. And you're going to have all these people. What impact do you think that will have on the economy over the next 10 years that would be different than the last 10 when they were still, you know, chewing gum as teenagers? Well, hopefully allowing more of our people to start retiring and have, have, have a pool to replace it. Um, the, the demographics, though, are still going to work to, to have uh, uh, downward uh, – on the participation rate. So I think the challenges of finding workers is still going to be a, a really tough thing to, to find out there. Um, keep in mind that the, the when we calculate out the participation rate, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does, um, they are counting uh, the available pool of workers. Well, who is who's representing the potential workforce? Well, it's anybody over the age of 16, regardless of age. You don't drop out of a potential workforce just because you reach a certain age. So only three things eliminate you. Uh, you're disabled, uh, you are incarcerated, or you're dead. Um, otherwise, you are a potential worker. But we know the fact that as you get older and older, the participation rates fall off dramatically as people enter the retirement ages. Um, I think the participation rate has been supported more recently by the fact that it's been a tough road for some of the boomers who are in there. 60s uh, and would maybe have thought about retiring because they were like, oh, I hit my 50s, 
now I'm going to start saving in earnest because my kids are out of college and blah, blah, blah. Then they hit the 2000s and the, and the Great Recession, where many of them saw, uh, they had, a, for example, a lot of investment in their home. A lot of those assets got damaged. Uh, if, if, if they were laid off from work, it took them a long time to get back. Even if you were employed, low wage gains, 401ks for many companies were discontinued. Um, uh, you know, if they, if they screwed up on the stock market investments and sold at the wrong time, that could have put them behind. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, the people approaching retirement might be challenged to retire the way they might have otherwise have thought, having gone through this great recession. That solution, of course, is you work longer. Uh, if you could work a few more years, that's a few more years that you're putting away money for retirement, as well as a couple of less years, unfortunately, that you'll have to spend in retirement because you'll be a couple of years older. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, the leading edge, you're talking about the millennials, but keep in mind that the baby boomers, uh, you know, at the back end of it, they're just turning 55 now. So assuming a 65 year for retirement, we've got 10 more years of this large group that will be, you know, retiring uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully getting replaced by the millennials. But millennials, but yeah, it's, it is a very large group. Uh, but it's, uh, so I think there are opportunities there. Um, but I, I, th I think the fact that we have the baby boomers stepping out is going to offset a lot of that. Uh, given your, your credit spread chart, is, is there an argument to be made that that's artificially kind of deflated right now, given the, the supply-demand characteristics of how much wealth has been created and where those funds need to go in those asset classes? Explain a little bit further. Maybe I'm not. So, so given that there, given that there's a lot of wealth out there yeah. that's having to be put in some of the higher yielding kind of asset classes, right? And so, from a supply demand perspective, it's you're, you're going to eat something that might give you a different profile than what you're accustomed yeah. to. So the okay. risk now, is yeah, so the so risk so is somewhat so hidden. Right. Right. And and I and I, you know, so what you're in essence, great point, maybe. Um, so, the, so the point is, have we forced people to take more risk just to chase yield? Uh, you, you know, and you hear about the fact that you know retirees who actually had to go back into the labor force because you know they were banking on getting a four percent, you know, bond to cover them, you know, government bond to cover them into the retirement. Those interest rates came down to practically nothing, and they realized they were eating into their principal, and they needed to go back to work to kind of offset some of that. Um, and therefore, you know, maybe some retirees started to chase and take more risk, put money into the equity markets much more than they typically should uh, on a, on a risk-weight basis. Could that be part of what's going on here? Possibly. And that's all the reason why, you know, uh, as much as, uh, you know, President Trump yesterday said he likes low interest rates, uh, as, by the way, all presidents like low interest rates. Um, uh, but the, the strengthening economy is justifying the Fed moving up those interest rates. The faster we go to neutral, because when we hit neutral, I'm taking my wife out for a wonderful dinner because it has been too far and too long below normal. Uh, and I think it's going to be a success for us when we get that up to a neutral stance uh, next year. When we get to that level, hopefully we're going to start seeing some of these interest rates adjust to allow uh, certain demographic groups, in particular those people who are approaching retirement or in retirement, to be able to get back to being able to take a less risk uh, weighted uh, portfolio in order to achieve their, their goals. And so, you know, I think that part of it is, yes, I mean, there, there is this excess amount that's out there, and that could be playing some role in this, possibly. Okay, I think we can sneak in one more question, if there's one. I don't know if this question will even make sense, but I'm just curious in any of the slides if, if there is an overlay in terms of like policy, tax policy, whether it's corporate tax or individual tax, if you see any um, trend, if, if, you, if you would see a trend. Like if you, the housing market slide, for example, you know, there were changes in the tax, mm -hmm. tax code last year. Is that why we're, we would see a dip? 
or is it too complicated? It, it, well, it's a factor. I mean, there's no doubt about it. The, the, the change in the tax law uh, made home ownership less attractive um, than, than it previously was. But I think that the uh, biggest factor that has been kind of weighing down on the, on the housing market is a complete alteration in the view of housing as an asset. And I think we can't deny the fact that the story that we had been told since World War II, uh, that home prices only go up, was clearly not true. Uh, and people bought into that, that it's a very safe investment. And actually, it was a good thing from the standpoint that most Americans are not very good savers. But at least if they bought a house, paid it off, you know, they would have something when they got close to retirement, perhaps better than what they otherwise would have done. Uh, although we had, and, and, and actually that still probably would have been okay, except for all of the home equity loans that started to crop up and make it very easy for people to strip out that equity and turn what could have been a 1980s vintage mortgage where it would have been, you know, a loan to value of 20% or something. Uh, it, they all of a sudden were able to borrow off of that. And when those, you know, markets corrected, all of a sudden they, they had a vintage loan that was more akin to something issued in 2000. Uh, and four in 2005. Um, so I think the kids who are now, keep in mind now, we've had 10 years of kids entering the workforce over this period of time. They saw what happened to, if not their own parents, perhaps their parents, but certainly relatives they know, friends, uh, parents, uh, and they realized that a uh, house was really not as good of an asset as people were led to believe. So I think there's got to be some kind of a, of a shock uh, going through a bit of a war in housing uh, that, that, that probably has impacted many of those kids as they saw people see the repossessions and, and, and uh, people being kicked out of homes and so forth. So I, I think that's part of it. And then add to it some of the psychology of millennials uh, with regard to they don't, and we're seeing in autos as well, they don't want to own vehicles as much as previous generations. Many of them don't even have licenses and they do seem to be the type that want to share are much better off doing an Uber uh, and spending their money taking trips uh, rather than actual owning a product. And that could very well be the way they view home ownership as well. Um, and we've seen the home ownership rate come down substantially. It has been moving back up a little bit, but still remains lower than when this whole thing started, uh, even before the financial crisis. So thank you very much.